very good and welcome everyone uh, to this event hosted by the Nordic Region Chapter of East. Uh, today's theme is something that we basically would all wish that was not relevant as, for us as editors and authors, but unfortunately it is. Unethical publishing, especially what is known as predatory publishing, is a pressing problem for everyone involved in scientific publishing and a theme that we all should have a fairly good knowledge about, both to avoid such publishers and journals ourselves and to be able to teach others about the problems and the consequences of unethical publishing. So it's therefore with great pleasure I introduce to you all Ines Stefan, who is Editor-in-Chief of Eurosurveillance and who will teach us more about the basics of predatory deceptive journals and publishers. And after Ines' presentation, we will open up for a Q&A session and we'll finish in about one hour maximum. Uh, and if you would like, during Ines' uh, talk, you could write in your questions in the chat, or you could do that afterwards, during the Q&A. So, welcome, Ines. Good afternoon, everyone, on this snowy and cold day, I guess, all over the Nordic. And um, it's a pleasure. Oh, no, there's someone from Croatia, so you don't have snow. When you don't have minus 15 degrees. So welcome to everyone who joins our Nordic seminar of the East Nordic chapter today. And um, I will share my screen and start my presentation. Uh, so predatory journals, a little bit about, and as uh, Aura already said, it's not good for us as publishers and editors, but it's equally bad for science and often it's just money wasted. And if you think about the history of predatory publishers, how did the term, how was the term coined? Um, they are also called fake, fraudulent, deceptive, acting in bad, bad faith, or pseudo journals. And some time ago in 2009, a librarian on his own, really, Jeffrey Beale, noticed a phenomenon that was coinciding with the increase of golden access. Uh, open access journals, that there were more and more journals or articles being published that seemingly did not concur with what we consider as ethical publication. They, there was, I think, inside, oh, editorial oversight, there was missing information, the quality was bad, there was no adequate curation, and so he started identifying with a group of volunteers journals that he coined predatory. And between 2010 and 2017, he ran a blog where he regularly updated a list of predatory journals and publishers. And the selection, as I mentioned already, was based on criteria from his own research and from input from volunteers. And as many know over time, uh, there was a scrutiny because some of the journals on Beale's list were maybe questionable with some aspects of publishing, but not all. And uh, so the Beale's list ceased to exist uh, a couple of years ago. However, versions of the list are still circulating online and others have also taken on board uh, the activities that Beale had conducted to some extent um, or in different forms. And so the one problem that we have is we don't really have a commonly accepted definition for the practice because it's not so easy to nail down where this practice begins and where it ends. But the most common agreed um, features of a predatory journal is that these are end and publishers that they self prioritize their own interests and at the expense of good quality and scholarship and they, they make misleading uh, promises, publish misleading information, and they don't concur with the, what we consider good editorial standards and publication practices. And there's, of course, a lack of transparency, and they often have aggressive and, and indiscriminate solicitation, solicitation practices, and most of you will have 
come across these. And as you can see, this phenomenon was particularly also at the early onset of the uh, pandemic, because as you will see later on, on, on one of my uh, screens, you will see that this problem has increased, and particularly with the pandemic, of course, this problem of money making enterprises not concurring with standards has increased. So if you think about how big is this problem, Cabell has started in 2017 listing, so that was when Beale started to see, stopped to its existence. Cabell took over creating a list with journals that were considered of non-ethical predatory publishing. And it started with 4,000 journals in its list in 2017. And if you consider only by 2022 in January, there were already 50, well over 15,000 journals on that list. So you can see here, and these are data from 2022, how much this market, which is a big money mar money making undertaking, is increasing, and particularly, of course, health, but also mathematical science physical sciences have and economics and biology have to deal with this problem. So another question of looking into how big the problem is is in how far is this money making undertaken, taking how much money does that generate? And if you look at the older figures, so the volume in four years of predatory publishing and predatory money making has increased four times just at between 2010 and 2014. And in 2020, it was estimated that uh, this market generated nearly 200,000 million US dollars. That's a lot of money. And if you think about who's involved, it's not just the usual suspects that you may think these are people from countries where, where they are pr under pressure to publish. It's all across the board that this is a, is a practice. And, well over 1.2 million researchers globally admitted that they had submitted to a predatory journal or attended a predatory conference, which is not the focus of this talk, but this is another problem, of course. And so how would you recognize that this journal that you're targeting is not a journal that has ethical practices? And because over time, the journals that were very easy to recognize times have become much smarter and they look really like reputable journals often. So what you still should look for is, and what is a common trait, is the lack of editorial oversight. There's no quality assurance in form of peer review or there is a form of paid peer review. There's very little done on the editing of the text. There are no mechanisms for correction in case of errors. And so this is an important uh, element, as we all know, scholarly publishing. The board may be fake and the affiliations by some board members may be wrong, but you will also find people who, uh, without themselves knowing, find themselves as being named on the board of a predatory journal. So this is very difficult to verify, of course, if an expert who you know very well is really on the board of a journal or not, other than by verifying this with themselves. With themselves. So another point is, as I mentioned already, is the after publication procedures that entail not only the correction of errors, but also curation and indexation. And this is all in the predatory journals, they often uh, boost about impact factors, which are not really impact factors, fake impact factors. And they also often mention Google Scholar being indexed in Google Scholar. And of course, you all know that Google Scholar is a search, it's a database and not an index. And so overall, these journals are not sustainable and the research is harder to retrieve in the future and may even disappear. So in 2020, the inter-academic partnership, uh, a global network, a, a number of science, engineering and medical academies came together and launched a two-year study 
on exactly the problem that we're talking about. And the primary goal of this undertaking was really to give editors, authors, and everyone involved in the, in the publishing field as some indication of what could help to curb the increasing problem that we all see and that we all face, and which is impacting negatively on the scholarly record. So interestingly enough, and this is the one of the mo most relevant uh, tables of figures from this uh, report, which is re reading, is that it's important maybe not to look at this is predatory and this is not predatory. It's not as black and white as I said earlier. So this is a continuum between fraudulent, deceptive and good quality. So if you look at this, you will see that there are listed the typical markers for high risk of being a fraudulent, deceptive journal. And also some journals that may not be fully fraudulent or deceptive, but they may be on the beginning of being established. So some of the quality traits that we look for in well-established journals or with well-established publishers, they may not yet be available for those journals who have just started to exist. So these are some very important markers that some of them I mentioned already uh, that are the typical features that would help you guide uh, your judgment of whether or not you're dealing with a journal that has quality or that has no low quality or that is even potentially considered to be fraudulent. So what is at stake? And I mentioned already that there is the quality of research, which is very important for us, of course, because flawed non-quality checked information will find its way for predatory journals into the public domain and uh, giving it a seemingly authoritative journal label. So, and particularly there, because it's often, it is coupled with open access, this makes it even more dangerous because people who may not know about, about the predatory journals and also about the quality of the science who may not be able to judge on the quality of the findings, they can access these findings and can still consider that these are valid findings that they want to take action on and consider this information as information that is trustworthy and uh, take it further in their own day-to-day, -day, either bus business activities or whatever field you work in. And then also trust in science is, of course, at stake because uh, if this fraudulent information in a fraudulent journal or low quality information in a fraudulent journal leads to action and or cl claim based on unreliable findings once these are refuted, this will in turn in a vicious cycle return on science itself. And also, as I mentioned several times now, there's the danger of diluting, distorting the evidence because if these findings that are of quality enter the scientific evidence base, for example, in, in through meta-analysis or systematic reviews, when they are not performed with the adequate rigor as it should be, then this could mean that this is endangering in the field of health, for example, this could lead to false conclusions that potentially endanger people's health. And you will see equally to flawed research, even when it is withdrawn from, uh, retracted from a from a trustworthy scientific journal, it may still have quite some impact. These articles may have a longer term impact because they will not even be withdrawn at one or from the scientific literature. So, so correction of the scientific record, I mentioned this already, but it's good to repeat times and again that this is an important added value of good scientific pra publishing practice that we correct the record if necessary. So what happens if a researcher publishes in a fraudulent journal? Actually, what is at stake is the personal and institutional reputation. So it depends on the institutions, but the institutions where this can lead to disqualification for tenure, 
it could lose uh, in, in losing your research grants, for example. And when you publish there, uh, of course, you may lose the copyright for your findings. And maybe even if the findings are good, they may not be cited so often because the journal, if it boasts uh, indexation in databases where it isn't, then it could be, it's not easy to retrieve the information. And uh, we had a discussion in, in at least one of the East conferences, uh, and I think we even had a debate on it, whether or not one should cite a good article published in a predatory journal. And I think this is a very difficult answer, question to answer. So what, of course, is at stake is also the scientific exchange and advancing science. So what are the pay, what are the points that you can consider? What makes a journal predatory or fraudulent? Fake promises, as I mentioned, of high scientific quality, bogus impact factors, and I listed some of it of these here. And it's not so easy if you read quickly, because the scientific journal impact factor sounds a bit familiar, but not quite. Then also what these journals promise is a low turnaround time for publishing manuscripts and very low submission costs. But even if you have low submission costs, article processing charges, the high amount of articles will make a lot of money then still. And predators are the ones who try to make profit from the researchers and they try to really capitalize on the need to publish in order to have an advance in the career, in order to boost your reputation. Who else could be the victim of publishing in a predatory journal? For example, researchers with limited funding, early career researchers. And sometimes it's said that particularly people in lower and middle income countries would be subject to rather publish in such journals because of the of the article processing charges involved. However, I can assure you this is not so true because as I mentioned earlier, if you look into analysis of where in terms of geography people have the of the authors, main authors who corresponding authors who published in predatory journals, they come from all countries, even high income countries. Other researchers who are under pressure to publish, uh, I list again, early career researchers, in those in a very competitive environment and trying to advance your career fast. But then there are also these people who are just ignorant or not naive, innocent. So what are the red flag signs when you look for a predatory publisher. There are some easy and not so easy ones. Sloppy websites with typos, blurred images, fake office addresses. That was more in the past with the ease of new tools that we have, and I guess artificial intelligence uh, tools such as uh, Chatbot, GP. They will also contribute to making these, these sites, these typos, these not so good phrase text, they will make this more difficult because they will be uh, phrased more elegantly, the, the English will be better maybe, and also uh, titles will be will be um, will be avoided. So missing information is often a criteria, missing information on who retains copyright and how the quality assurance process works. But again, these days a lot of the Predatory journal publishers and journals have really caught up on that. Publisher based in low and middle income country, again, not only a publisher who sets up a great number of access journals from various disciplines at the same time. That's really something which I think can still be a red flag, irrespective of what is what is happening on in other domains. And uh, unsolicited commissioning emails with non-professional email extensions for the editor or the publisher and very flattery or repeated invitations, also invitations to submit on topics that are not really in your field of subject matter equity. And a red flag is if someone asks you already to pay at submission and not to ask the acceptance, this is a red flag. 
And aside from all these red flags, luckily there's several tools out there that can help identify spot predatory journals. So COPE has a whole series of discussion documents. There's the Cabels list as I showed. You can check the directory of open access journals. There is also, and this is very important, Think Check Submit. Your own brain and Think Check Submit nicely outlines how you could do this. There's a whole checklist, which I think is a bit too complex from a US American university. So some universities, some librarians have come up with their own tools to which is identify fraudulent publishing, fraudulent journals. However, I think my favorite is still being check submit because it's quite easy and it also guides you through thinking when you have some doubts. Then there are a lot of other tools and I have listed some tools here and also ease has tools. And one important message is for me is don't forget the human helpers. Talk to your librarians, talk to your colleagues, and maybe sometimes even to your legal advisors. Because once you have signed a contract, there's no way of getting out there. There is no obligation by a predatory journal publisher to uh, to take off your article from the website, to give you back your copyright. They're not interested in doing this. So. This was something where I had uh, put something together for a course where I have listed various publishers and where I suggested that everyone in their own time goes through the list of these publishers or journals and tests the skills and tries out the tools that I have put on the other slide. And maybe if we share these slides, some of you would be interested to also test and hone your own skills. So last but not least, before I'm done, I want to say we're in this together. So the interest in curbing this practice is the same for scientists, academics, scholars, editors, publishers, and institutions. And with this, I'll stop sharing my computer and thank you for your attention. Back to Ore. Thank you, Ines, for the most clear and um interesting presentation uh you might have noticed everyone that maria hodgson hodgson has uh, put in the chat to the video presentations earlier ones from 2022 from east and i would recommend you to look at those if you're interested in diving even deeper into this uh, so we open up for q and a's or comments or whatever is on your mind. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yes, Catherine. we can. I have to just remind myself about my question, but I can't see it now. So I asked one about, um, I think, top tips for any early career researchers or students. Um, if you could just give them maybe kind of a, yeah, your best top tips for having to identify and then avoid uh, predatory journals. The top tips are really, I would say personally, I mean, is, is use your brain. That's the first one. If you have any, you know, often it's a feeling. It is not evident from the start, but it's a feeling because as I mentioned, there are many different elements that play a role. And then it's good to, to be aware of this practice. That's, I think, the first important step to be aware that there is such practice. And then try out some of the tools that I've shown. Try out, in case of doubt, really go use a tool, use things, check, submit, and go for the criteria because there is no single criterion that will help you. And I have looked up over time the same websites on this website, and I find it more and more difficult to identify which ones are on the edge and which ones are really are really uh, bad. There is, and um, I don't think I had this. I had this um, slide in this presentation, but you know there is there are different lists. There's the, the Beals list, which somehow still exists. There's the Cabell Cabell database, and there's there are other lists. And if you put those together, you will see no list captures. So there is no hundred percent overlap. 
You know, there may be, say, an 80% overlap, but you will have the outliers, which are only captured by Carol, which were only classified as fraudulent predatory by uh, by Beale. And this is where you need to use your brain, right? Because there, as I said before, there is no black and white. And we have all followed the discussion about some of the publishers that we know quite well, and which were considered publishers that we we would accept and all of a sudden there was a debate and they were falling into the category of maybe their practices are not as ethical as we thought and and this is where it's very difficult but the, i think the first step is awareness and have a librarian go to a librarian they're pretty smart mm. that is a good tip and and there's also the tip about using not the black lists but the white lists such as the director of open access journals because they are all already checked uh but kath you also had a question about ai tools yes i did i wondered what impact um you think that generative ai tools like chat gpt um, could have on predatory journal practices. And I guess maybe I'm thinking in terms of how convincing a predatory journal might be in terms of passing for a, a well, proper journal, for want of a better phrase. But maybe also just in terms of their, you know, the sorts of articles that they're putting out and, and how you can really identify that these things are, well, dodgy, to be blunt. Honestly, I wouldn't know. I think this is the big fear that we all have, is that AI will threaten and challenge us in a way there will be many opportunities for all of us uh, with generative AI tools that are out there, but they will also challenge us to an extent which we haven't, which we, we are not even able to think through in all of the details. And that's what I also try to mention, you know, the websites will look very and they and, and not only with the generative AI, I think there will be future tools, AI-generated tools to create a journal, a journal website, with everything that you want to have on a journal website. I'm pretty sure this will follow soon. And there, I, I don't know, I, I, I heard, it, I, I checked around a little bit, and as far as I understand, we don't even have tools to identify AI writing properly in articles uh, at the moment, no standard or not generally agreed tools. So I think this is a very, very complicated air area where we enter and, and we will just have to, to put our heads together. Often it is, the good thing is that when you ask them too much and not specifically enough, the good thing is the hallucination and there are still some red flags, even with some of the AI tools. But they will become better and they will disappear, the red flags, I guess. And there's also all kinds of problems with AI and deceptive publishing at large. Uh, I think it was in Science just last week, uh, an article about ChatGPT uh, that was hallucinating a data set, a complete data set. Uh, so that's scary. Gary, but that's not a problem. But that then uh, Abdes, uh, Abdelazim Eldawatli has a question about predatory conferences, which is quite interesting and adds to the complexity of this topic in us. Yeah. I deliberately stayed away from that, to be honest. I mean, I just I, I just can tell anecdotal stories about it. And and you, you may receive sometimes inv invites to conferences again. Uh, use your, you know, use your gut feeling and scrutinize these if you have to do some pre-financing to go somewhere. I'm aware that that there have been instances where scientists traveled, uh, traveled far away across the Atlantic or elsewhere and ended up uh, being unfortunately uh, alone in a place where there was no conference and not many other people, at least mm. not people who wanted to attend the conference, which is very sad because you have invested time and money. Uh, so uh, I, I'm not an expert on that, but uh, the, the report that I uh, have put in there, the report by the academies, 
an inter-academy report that tackled specifically also the problem of predatory conferences. Hmm. Um, and then uh, oh, good. there's things going on both in the chat and in the Q&A, so I'm trying to keep an eye on them both. Uh, Dominic Mitchell adds that there's a service like ThinkCheck Submit for predatory conferences as well. So that's that's good to know. Uh, and then Manu Jain Goyal has a question and wants to ask that orally. Please. Um, hi. <clears throat> hi, thank you for a wonderful talk. Uh, I have a question. Uh, in one of your slides, you mentioned that there's uh, some red flags for the predatory journal. And one of them was um, fees, asking uh, fees at submission, not after the acceptance. Um, is it different than the submission fees? Because I know some of the journals, they do have submission fees, which is, I think, different than the acceptance fees. Uh, and this is usually um, journals are doing to um, filtering uh, the quality of science or for paper mill things or some other reasons. So just want to know um, uh, it, it, if it is different than the submission fees or it's all over together, uh, all, all together this piece is about. Again, it, it, I, I'm sorry that I had so but there's this and that. There's such Sorry. A, what I mean is, um, I may sound evasive, but there are situations, and it's just one of the criteria that you will have to look at, right? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a strong indication. Giving money before any, any service is often difficult, right? But this is the first, maybe the first red, and what I meant with red flags is, this is the first red flag that should trigger you to look further, to look into other elements that could also be flags. And if you have a number of red flags, that may make you hesitant and you should probably go somewhere else with your submission. It's not it's not a single element, as I said. It could be a, a journal which has just been started and which is not so long on the market. You know, some of the practices of of a journal that's new on the market will deviate from other journals' practices. And over time, they may change. But it's one, one consideration that you have to do. And you have to say, oh, what? And then you go on and you move on and you check other elements as well. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and besides, if I may add, if you pay up front when you uh, when you submit your manuscript you're on the hook so if they then want you to pay even more afterwards well you won't get off the hook because they have your manuscript and they can publish it and then you're lost so don't pay before mm. uh, uh, and then Sinina Ahunas has a question. Uh, how do you think scientists who have published in predator journals or participated in predatory conferences can protect themselves? I don't think you, it's not easy to protect yourself. I know in the US, the CDC, the US CDC or the US government has taken a predatory publisher to court. And it was very difficult. And if you can imagine that a powerful entity uh, like that has problems in taking a, a predatory publisher to court, you can imagine how difficult it will be for you as an individual to uh, to take any legal steps. I think if you, if you if you if you can Google around a little bit and you hear stories of of, of people which are really really. I am aware of a colleague, a former colleague who submitted in good faith to a uh, predatory journal, they were not able to get back. As I mentioned, we had a legal department looking into this. There was no means once you've signed a contract, you are in it. And that's the lesson that I think everybody needs to learn. And this is why it's so important. There's very little you can do. There are stories on the web if you if you want to read them up about people who 
support for getting their manuscripts back and getting the ownership and the copyright back that uh, who were not able or who were even asking to take to take uh, their, their publication off a website is not always followed. Mm. I, I mean, this is why it's fraudulent. This is why it's deceptive. If, if it wasn't this behavior, it could probably be considered on the edge of bad behavior. But this is what it makes it really also a legal problem. Mm. Well, thank you. Then Mary has added two, uh, two messages in the chat. One, have any of you submitted to a Predator journal in error? If so, would you like to share your experience? So far, no one has done, and that might be... Uh, <laughs> That might be because it's it, it could be quite embarrassing to to have been uh, lured into that kind of practice. Um, I have actually tried once, but with open eyes. I created a fake manuscript and I sent it into a predatory journal. It was instantly accepted and I was invited as a, as a keynote lecturer to one of their fake conferences. So it's very quick uh, to, to get into that problem. Uh, well, uh, it seems like we have run out of questions thank you everyone for so much uh, activity both in the chat and in the q a um oh the patreon jakes has a new question could an article published open access in a reputable journal under an open license be published again in predatory journals I well what do you think of that ines I I think so, and um, you know there there there's also a practice which we didn't touch on here that whole journals are hijacked and mimicked. Open access journals are mimicked and hijacked, right? And I think uh, our French colleague um, Hervé uh, Maison uh, Maisonneuve. Uh, no, I don't remember if I pronounced the family name correct. A former East uh, Council member has experienced. Maisonneuve, so it was okay. Thank you, Mary, <laughs> for confirming. So Hervé had once uh, reported that he was subject, uh, he and a journal that he was involved with, were subject to such practice. Of course, I mean, we as open access, we give the license for others, depending if it's a BCC by license, you allow others to reuse your content. Someone could create a whole journal with your content, right? And they could even be legal but if they would then say, cite the source and sell it. This was something that I never had fully understood, but it would be legal if someone can take your content, combine it, compile it, put put a nice cover around it and sell it to people if it's published on a CC BY license. Mm. So um, I don't think you there's much you can do in that sense. I mean, of course, the predatory publishing is in a way I mean, it shouldn't be because we have all the we have all the uh, provisions that we shouldn't do double double publication. But that's when we follow publication ethics. If people don't follow the rules that we've set, there's very little that we can do. Hmm. Thank you. Um... Yes, and Dominic Mitchell adds to the point that you made, Ines, uh, that uh, predatory publishing practices are not only seen in open access journals. There are many closed access journals or long-running journals that also have very questionable publishing practices. That's a good point, indeed. Uh, yeah, could you I, want to add to that? Could I ask something, Dominic? Maybe you could, um, I mean, the oh, director of open access journals you went through a, can you maybe uh, tell the story of how several years ago you, you had every journal going through a new accreditation process, particularly because of the problem of predatory publishing? And what are you doing these days in order to uh, ensure that as little as possible uh, fraudulent, uh, questionable publishing creeps into your directory? 
Hi, hi, Ines. Yes, that's right. We um, it was back in two thousand and fifteen that we started to rewrite the criteria uh, to be indexed in DOAJ, and then we sent those out for public consultation. And that was particularly triggered by the fact that we had noticed a huge rise in journals that we'd never seen before, um, either saying that they came from the United States or that they came from the UK. When on closer uh, uh, investigation, they came from other countries um, in in the world, and we and at that point there was a lot of um, uh, attention, media attention being drawn to this this phenomenon that uh, Jeffrey Beale had called predatory uh, publishing. Um, so we made, I think it was just short of nineteen thousand journals. We made them all reapply to be re-indexed, and um, I think something like sixty five percent of those journals came back into the directory with um, having met all of our new criteria. And it was around 2,800 journals that we removed from the directory, mostly because they hadn't responded to us. Um, and that was for a variety of reasons. But there were also, of course, um, a whole load of journals that just didn't make the new criteria. And since then, DOAJ has now has developed its own quality team. So we have a team of dedicated um, professionals who go through and manually review journal applications if they are flagged by the rest of the team as being questionable. We like to avoid the term predatory because it's very much the view of one person. Um, so we refer to them as question questionable practices. Um, but yeah, it was a it was a large. It was a large operation, and uh, in the words of our dear founder, Lars Björnshager, he said, we'll, we will never do that again, because <laughs> it was a lot of work. But uh, we've been able to build on the quality criteria that we have now, and we've been able to keep them out of DOAJ. Um, and we use the community to help us keep the directory up to date. Um, so we are, so it's, so far, we, it's been going very well since then. Would you? I have. Can I ask another question to Dominique? Because I, I, we were at the time we were affected by the need to reapply. So I'm pretty mm. aware of that. I'm also aware of that. We try to uh, get a bit on the fast lane for our reapplication because it yes. took quite some time. So the question for me would be: Do your colleagues be more flagged, than do your colleagues did they realize well, not only more flagged maybe, but do, did they realize a certain improvement in the quality of questionable journals? You know, that they were becoming, look, they mimic uh, a pro proper journal much better recently. And how, what tools do they use and what, how, how do they deal with that? Yes. Um, so we have, we, we have noticed that, that there are, that there are waves of, uh, innovation uh, in inverted commas about how uh, journals are uh, being more and more deceptive. Um, I think you mentioned one already, Ines, about um, sort of hijacking other websites and pretending to be a website uh, when it's not. There's also jumping on other people's domains when the domains expire. There is also, um, you know, using Trojans and spyware if the um, if the website hasn't uh, upgraded to HTTPS. And we, I think we're, we are at the moment, there are four or five individuals in the quality team um, who are regular managing editors approving uh, applications. Um, and, but they also um, do some time sort of looking at all of these journal, these applications that are, that are marked as questionable, either by um, the managing editors themselves or by the, the the community so um the way that uh, i wouldn't like to speak out of turn because our head of uh, quality is sen yu shen um and she actually runs runs that team so i don't know precisely which tools that they use but um it's everything is checked manually and it's particularly as you highlighted in us checking the editorial board you know our, do these people exist? Are they still alive? Do they know that they are on the board? And we often email the board members to see if they are aware that they are on an editorial board. 
And then we do some more sort of technical searches around domain names and we look at addresses, where, where, is, their, where is their address registered? We look at the content, um, you know, these, in some very obvious cases, you have papers that are published in the journal that, that don't match the scope of the journal, for example. So the, the, there are a whole, there are a whole sort of, there's a, a, a wide range of different tools that, that they use. Well, thank you. That's reassuring to know for those who use directory of open journals as a whitelist when deciding where to publish. Uh, but before I, uh, Howard Brownman has a question, but before that question, I just wanted to say that uh, we do these webinars in the Dorn Nordic chapter three or four times a year. So if you have any themes you want us to cover or any anything you want those webinars to be about, please uh, tell us. You can email uh, Ease, Mary Hodgson's, or Ines Stephens, or me, if you have any tips for things we should cover in these webinars. But then to Howard Brahman's questions, what about Duai's recent attempt to limit journals that publish a lot of guest edited special issues? Well, that is something that since we have Dominic uh, as a panelist right now, you might answer yourself. I don't want to hijack this, uh, this, this <laughs> wonderful event. <laughs> um, very, very quickly, and I'd be very happy to follow up with Howard, who is a, a good colleague of mine afterwards. But uh, we had noticed that there was a proliferation, a proliferation of special issues um, being um, published, issued by some uh, very well-established publishers, but also being used as a business model for some less well-established publishers. And so together, in consultation with the World Association of Medical Editors, with COPE and with OASPA, the Open Access Scholarly Publishers Association, we um, pulled some, we produced some guidelines which we uh, published recently and added to our criteria where we have limited, um, we have special requirements for journals that, that publish special issues. Yeah. Um, we released those, I think, a week or two ago, and we're in the middle of refining them even further so as not to exclude social science and humanities journals that may very well publish genuine themed issues because that's the nature of their research. Mm. Well, thank you. Uh, and besides being a problem as a form of deceptive revenue, uh, these special issues also have another side to them. I was a few years ago invited to be a guest editor of one of those. And that was a very respectable journal. And uh, the editor told me that, well, they could make a special is issue if I made sure that every article in a special issue cited at least four articles uh, from the same journal within this last two years. So that's another way of making that a deceptive practice. Yes. Well, I guess that's it for today. We are at 7 to 3 Nordic time. And I would like to thank Ines for her presentation. And I would like to thank everyone for very much activity, both in the Q&A and in the webinar chat. Uh, and um, I would like to re-invite you all to our next webinar. Uh, yes. Yeah, so um, just to let you know about the next three events really coming up this side of Christmas. Uh, so tomorrow our Indian chapter are running uh, a webinar called The Fundamentals of Alt Text. Um, it's actually at 3 p.m. India time, not 2, but it's at 9.30 UK time, so it's maybe easier to calculate it from that. But that's correctly uh, on the website. So if you want to go to that, go go to the website now and register. That's free to register for anyone. So anyone for whom alt text is a interesting topic, let's go there. Um, and then the next one is next Tuesday. Uh, so that's with Laura Feetham. Um, she's looking at co-reviewing, ensuring early years careers, early career researchers are recognised. And um, so that's our normal member webinar series uh, next Tuesday. And then the following week, 
uh, we have our our kind of pre-Christmas get together, um, which Duncan is going to host. Duncan Nicholas, our past president, um, he's going to host that, and we're going to be chatting about communication channels. How you, um, you know, how how are you getting your communication? How are you getting on with social media? Are you still with Twitter, or have you gone elsewhere? Um, what sort of ways do you like to receive your information? So that's an informal chat before Christmas. Um, uh, you just can register for that for for free and come along if you would like to. So all of those things on our website. So go there and uh, and find your way uh, to all that information and register if you need to. Wonderful. Thank you. Lots of activity to catch up on then before Christmas. Uh, thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.